Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, our dream speaker, who was selected by Lindsey Vaughn and, and uh, Larry Jamison. Uh, Larry is a graduate of UNC with honors and stayed on, and over the next five years after graduating college, graduated AOA from the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and uh, with a PhD in biochemistry. He then went on to the Mass General for residency and stayed on for research and clinical fellowship in endocrinology. After two years uh, as an instructor, he became an assistant professor quickly ascended to being an associate professor after five years at Harvard, and then was recruited, as I um, see it, just five years after joining the, the faculty to become division head uh, at Northwestern for endocrinology, where he remained in that position for seven years, was then uh, promoted to being, being uh, chair of the Department of Medicine at Northwestern, and subsequently, another seven years later, became vice president and dean at Northwestern, uh, where he served until 2011, when he was recruited to his current position as executive vice president for the University of Pennsylvania for the health system, dean of the Perlman School of Medicine, and the Robert G. Dunlop Professor of Medicine. He's very well published and well known for a number of research interests, including the genetic basis of endocrine disease and regulation of gonadotropin gene expression. He lists over 250 original articles, 18 books, 65 uh, chapters, and two patents. He's been very well funded throughout his career from the NIH uh, foundations and the DOD. And really impressive is his commitment to training. I made note of 70 postdoctoral fellows and graduate students that have studied with him. He's an excellent uh, academic citizen, uh, serving in major roles with the International Society of Endocrinology and the American Board of Internal Medicine. He's currently on the board of the Association of Academic Health Centers and the administrative board for the AAMC. He's serving in, in um, important positions in various um, uh, journals and um, editorships, and since, uh, since uh, 19, 1997 has served as an editor for Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. Um, along the way, of course, he's received a number of awards, too many to mention, but various from the American Thyroid Association, the Endocrine Society, and the American College of Physicians and American College of Surgeons. He's been elected to the major organizations in academic medicine, the American Society of Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. He's past president of the Endocrine Society and, and uh, past president of the Association of American Physicians. Now along the way, of course, he's given numerous national and international lectures. He's served as a number of named, uh, in a number of named professorships, uh, but never in his uh, esteemed um, career has he been a dream speaker. So uh, he'll be able to add that to his uh, list of accomplishments. I'm really delighted that Lindsay identified Larry, who is an old friend, uh, as uh, her choice as the speaker that we would have for Grand Rounds today. And today he'll be addressing uh, the very important topic of precision medicine, personalized, promising, and problematic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jameson. Oh, good morning. And uh, Lindsay and the Chief Residents, thanks so much for inviting me. I can't believe that I've never been to Madison before. Uh, what a lovely place. I had a chance yesterday afternoon to walk around a little bit. I'm sure none of you will ever leave this place. It's idyllic, at least uh, in late May and, and early June. So uh, this morning, I want to talk about a topic that I know uh, you've all heard about, uh, precision medicine, and tell you why I think this is an important area for us to pay attention to. I want to underscore a couple of things about it, and I'll do that in the first part of the talk. Uh, first, I don't think this is really a new area. And second, uh, there really should be no uh, competition between the idea of precision and personalized. I think they're, they're complementary features. So 
So first, uh, just a, a definition. What is precision medicine? Uh, these, these are treatments that are targeted to the needs of the individual patient. And they're often, but not always, based on genetic features or biomarkers. You know, think uh, cholesterol as a biomarker. Certain phenotypic characteristics of the patient. And even uh, psychosocial characteristics. Now, I think this really became a prominent part of the public perspective when President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative a little bit over a year ago now. And this launched a number of, of editorials and debates about, you know, is this a good thing? Uh, is it going to detract from a focus on, on public health? And I, I think these are things we could discuss a, a bit further. But I, I want to underscore from my perspective that precision medicine and uh, personalized medicine are really one and the same thing. So when I first brought this up at the University of Pennsylvania, you know, my doctor said, well, you know, I thought I've been practicing personalized medicine my entire career. And I said, well, you have. And, you know, this is just the evolution. Uh, this is a painting that many of you have, have probably seen. It's from the late 1800s when physicians were really not armed with the tools that we have available to us today. And I think it, it underscores the fact that we still offer a lot, even when we can't deliver some of the high-powered treatments that are available to us today. So this shows the doctor providing comfort. It's not so obvious that the parents are in the background, you know, grieving. And this little girl has just dropped a flower on the floor uh, she probably has just passed away from an infectious disease that we could easily uh, either prevent with vaccines today or treat uh, with antibiotics. Uh, but this will always be the role of, of healthcare providers, the personalized part of precision medicine. And from a historical perspective, I like to think about the, the evolution of this over really centuries, where you know, Harvey began to describe the circulatory system, providing a first clue about physiology of, of the cardiovascular system, the evolution of our understanding of metabolism and pathology, uh, the evolution of, of genetics. And then as we, as we come forward uh, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the development of some of the antibiotics that we use. So one way to think about precision medicine is Right now, if a patient comes in with a fever and, and a presumed infection, the first thing we're going to do is try to identify the bacterial organism. And then once we identify the organism, we can make some good guesses about antibiotic sensitivity. But it's even better if you get those sensitivity results back and then you target the antibiotic treatment to the organism. This is precision medicine. We've been doing it for a few decades. Uh, but it's an example, I think, of the concepts uh, behind the field. So in my field, in endocrinology, uh, precision medicine is sort of what we do as endocrinology with hormone replacement. And this is an example of a, of a paper that Lisa Fish uh, published in the 1980s that shows replacement of L-thyroxine. And you see that this is a log scale for TSH see the decline of TSH as L-thyroxine is replaced. And basically what you do is, is titrate it. You titrate it back uh, so that you bring the TSH into the normal range. Uh, but there's a spectrum of LT4 doses that are necessary across different patients. It may be that you know, some people have a little residual thyroid function. Maybe they metabolize the L-thyroxine a little differently. Maybe they absorb it a little differently. So this is a very good example, in my mind, of precision medicine to, to titrate in an individualized way the LT4 replacement to get the TSH into the optimal uh, range for an individual patient. So in this uh, review that Dan Longo and I published in the New England Journal, we, we mapped out some of these, these concepts and I'm going to begin with the idea that most, most diseases are, are fairly heterogeneous, and we lump them together. 
And as a, as a new diagnostic test becomes available, it allows us to focus on the taxonomy, the classification of that disease in a more refined way. And so we end up with, with subtypes of A, B, and C, and one of the implications of these subtypes is they may have different prognostic implications. So think, for example, about the classification of lymphomas or leukemias. Now they, they began as you know, one group, and then they become different subtypes with different prognostic implications. Now that becomes really important when you've got new targeted treatments that potentially are effective for one subtype and maybe not uh, for a, a different subtype. So this is fundamentally the debate between the lumpers and the splitters, if you've heard that concept in medical school. And I'll just say outright that I'm a splitter. You know, I think that's where medicine is going, into more and more refined classification of disease that allows us to have a better idea about how to manage patients in a precise way. So we have a new targeted treatment. This always re involves clinical research to evaluate the outcomes, the safety, the cost. Uh, this is where regulatory review comes into place. I, th I think all of us would agree that the time from sort of discovery to implementation is longer than it should be. It's often 15 or 20 years. We typically have it down to about 10 now, but that still is a very long process to go through, regulatory review. And critical in this is the value assessment. So what, what is the cost effectiveness for the benefit that we yield from these new treatments? Now, once you have this part in place, you then encounter the, the real clinical implementation of a new discovery, a new treatment. This usually begins with clinical guidelines, but it also requires adoption, adoption by payers, that patients are willing to adopt it, and that physicians and health systems adopt it. So this is sort of the, the, second, the second phase of implementation following regulatory review. And this, this frequently is another 10 years. I mean, just think about the adherence to clinical guidelines. It's usually around 50%. And so there's a big gap there just in, in following what we know works well, whether it's blood pressure guidelines or cholesterol guidelines, best practices in, in the field of medicine. This is an area, and I'll show an example later, where I think we should pay more attention and use other fields like psychology and behavioral economics to help us with more effective clinical implementation of what we know works. And we're aware of some of the blocks, patients' ability to afford uh, medicine. So even if you take that part out, uh, we know that about 50% of patients who've had a heart attack adhere in the next few years with the recommended treatments of whatever regimen they're put on, statins, beta blockers, low-dose aspirin. So when you think about the, the implementation, uh, you know, I've just schematically il illustrated the fact that you know, every patient has a unique medical history. Increasingly, we're able to embed that in a fairly permanent way in the electronic health record. But if I were to ask each of you in the room, where is your vaccine history? How well documented? Many of these things are probably with your pediatricians. <laughs> you know, and they've been updated over time. What about your family history? How many times have you repeated your family history? And how do you pull all of that information together and put it into the electronic uh, health record? There's an exposome, whether it's to sun and UV, uh, whether it's to, to diet, as we've heard about uh, recently, uh, lead. I mean, there are a lot of things in the environment have very important implications for disease that are unique to the individual. And then there's, of course, the genetic makeup, which we've thought so much about. Then the role of the health system in this interface is ideally to provide tools, tools for physicians to better manage patients, whether it's diagnostic capability, uh, informatics, working in the background, uh, to think about a systems approach uh, to population health. And out of this,
become population-based guidelines for screening and prevention. So we can think in a general way at the same time we think about the, the individual. And then development of specific diagnostic tests that are based on unique risks of the individual. So imagine, for example, that you've got someone who's at risk for being BRCA positive, BRCA1 or 2 positive, based on ethnic background, uh, family history. So you would tailor that treatment in the beginning uh, to someone with that risk profile. Or colon cancer might be another example with uh, colonoscopy testing. And ideally, again, the, the health system is providing some decision support in the background to assist the care providers. So I want to just underscore, because so much of the focus has been on cancer as it relates to precision medicine, because it's probably at the leading edge of targeted treatments, that there are examples of precision medicine in almost every specialty one can think of. So I'll go through just a, a few of these. So in, in cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, uh, hyperlipidemia is a very good example where based on LDL cholesterol, we can now use statins to greatly reduce the risk of, of cardiovascular disease. This is on my mind because Michael Brown of Brown and Goldstein was the graduation speaker for our medical school class last weekend. And he told the story about the discovery of the LDL receptor pathway and the link to that discovery of using statins to inhibit HMG-CoA reductase as a means to lower cholesterol and increase the uptake of, of LDL. Uh, it's a great story. It, it begins with Joe Goldstein recognizing with people at the University of uh, Washington, and you, I'm sure you know this story very well, Rick, having spent time up there, that based on, on population data, that there was a link between uh, high cholesterol and patients having heart attacks at a young age. And so that was a clue. And then when they went to the National Institutes of Health, the two of them, Brown and Goldstein, they saw young patients who were 8 years old, 12 years old, who were having heart attacks. That was the compelling reason to try to target this pathway uh, as an area for study. Now, in endocrinology, uh, if you've got multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, so you've all memorized the triad, right, of MEM1, and MEN2 to pass your boards, right? So that this is hyperparathyroidism in association with medullary thyroid cancer as the main features. Uh, so RET mutation, and what's come out of this is, is once you do the testing, if someone is RET positive, it, it often makes sense to do a prophylactic uh, thyroidectomy in those who are affected. Now, when, when Dr. Vince Krines and I began our training in endocrinology, before the discovery of the RET uh, proto-oncogene, if, if you had a family with MEN2, everyone in the family was tested on roughly a yearly basis, screened to find out were they developing the disease or not. And by then, it was usually too late. So we would measure the calcium levels, screen them for pheochromocytoma, uh, measure calcitonins, uh, and the nice thing about this kind of advance is if you're RET negative, you can forget about it. And if you're RET positive, then we've got some approaches that can de-risk uh, the profile. So it's another good example, I think, of, of precision medicine. Uh, cystic fibrosis. You know, step by step, uh, drugs are being developed that can target the CFTR transport pathway and really in a very significant way modify the, the clinical course for those patients. Right now, it's, it's mutation-specific. There's a second drug that's come out uh, that hits a, a broader group of these uh, mutations. But, you know, advances in pulmonology, endocrinology, uh, metabolic disease. Uh, in, in psychiatry, uh, depending on some uh, genetic uh, variants, uh, you can recommend, you know, certain kinds of, of treatments that can minimize the risk of, of al alcohol use, as an example. Certainly, infectious disease has many examples, as I mentioned with antibiotics, but 
if you think about the evolution of our understanding of HIV AIDS, it was really the, the understanding of the physiology of the HIV virus that allowed targeted treatments to the retroviral pathway and for some of the proteasome, uh, some of the uh, protein uh, inhibitors that have been used in that. Uh, hematology with uh, factor V Leiden. Now I'm going to give an example, and these two are, are highlighted uh, later to a blinding disorder that affects children, where gene therapy has been used. I mean, this is probably the, the ultimate example of targeted therapy, where if you've got a mutant gene, in this case RPE65, uh, it's possible to replace that. Actually substitute uh, that gene by adeno-associated viral delivery uh, in the retina of the eye. And you're familiar, I think, with some of the advances in, in cancer. So uh, if you've got the BCR able rearrangement associated with CML, there's a whole series of, of drugs that have been developed to target the able kinase, a great example of targeted therapy, and much preferable to just sort of general uh, chemotherapy approaches. So here's an example in ALK. Uh, positive lung cancer. So maybe, you know, 5% of patients with, with lung cancer will have this uh, particular kind of rearrangement. But if you do, uh, you can respond to a drug that inhibits uh, the ALK kinase. And if you don't have this rearrangement, you know, this drug is not going to provide any benefit. So from a cost-effective point of view, uh, this is an example where the testing helps to target the population who should be selected to receive the drug and those not to receive the drug. So I want to uh, give a, another example that you might not have uh, either heard about or, or thought about, and that's the ability to target the immune system to particular kinds of, of cancer. So you know, some of the immunotherapies that you've heard about are, are general just in terms of boosting the immune response, like the PD-1 uh, inhibitors. And they're very effective in uh, disorders like, like melanoma. But this particular example shown here is where a patient's own uh, T lymphocytes are removed and then taken into the laboratory. And the lymphocytes are then engineered by right now using lentivirus to put in a new receptor that is designed to target particular antigens on tumor cells. And so the uh, the first few uh, s studies have been with uh, CD19, which is expressed by a lot of B-cell malignancies, so either CLL or ALL. Certain kinds of, of lymphomas uh, you know, also express uh, CD19. So this, uh, this approach, and I'll, I'll show a very short video in a moment, uh, uses the, the T-cell to recognize and kill CD19 uh, positive tumors. So this is a natural function of T cells, but they're being engineered to actually uh, you know, target the tumor. So this is a three and a half minute video, so you won't go to sleep. It might be easier if the folks in the back can actually switch this on for me. nervous about the videos. Okay.
she's now four years after her treatment. I, I saw uh, Emma back at, at Penn with her family when uh, Joe Biden came to launch the moonshot for cancer. This was the second initiative that uh, President Obama announced following the Precision Medicine one uh, in his State of the Union address. You know, I, I think this is the power of science to use targeted treatments and precision medicine going forward. So Dr. Carl June, who was uh, speaking there, he's, he's essentially an HIV scientist. I mean, that's the problem that he's worked on most of his career. But that allowed him to have a deep understanding of, of T cells. And he realized that the HIV virus could essentially be used as a Trojan horse, right? I mean, what does it do? It wants to get into T cells. So you know, he worked with the cancer people uh, almost as a side project to say, you know, I think we could engineer this in a way that the, the cells could go after particular antigens on, on tumors. So the, the opportunity now is to go beyond the B cells. It's working very, very well in clinical trials now with, with CLL and ALL, both adult ALL and, and childhood. But if we can find unique antigens on other solid tumors, pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma is now in clinical trial, you know, this is a very promising approach, uh, which can be combined uh, with other things like the PD-1 uh, in inhibitors. So, a great example, I think, of precision medicine. Uh, I mentioned Gene Bennett's uh, work uh, using gene therapy. Uh, you know, we've now got about 12 different clinical trials lined up at Penn uh, to use gene therapy, largely for genetic uh, disorders that have devastating results in children. Uh, you know, some of these neurologic, and I think over the next five years, we'll see other examples of precision medicine using gene therapy. One thing I wanted to, to show uh, is, in addition to restoring the, the sight of the children, which is, of course, is, you know, magnificent, we're learning about uh, the plasticity of the nervous system. So if you looked at the, at the optic cortex, now that the children can see, this is a PET scan that shows that actually these pathways that have really you know, not been used develop over time. So this is providing new insights into the plasticity of, of the nervous system at the same time that it's providing clinical benefit. So just to broaden our thinking about how we apply uh, individualized treatments to patients, I mentioned behavioral economics. So at, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the, the business school is called Wharton. And uh, the Wharton Business School has a lot of people who are interested in healthcare and healthcare management. There's a group who study behavioral economics. And when I, when I came to Penn, I didn't know what behavioral economics was. I mean, the, the title sort of makes sense, but what do you actually do? Well, it, it turns out they've got very clever ideas about how to incent uh, patients and physicians to modify their behaviors in ways that have been intractable over time. So I, I mentioned the adherence rates of patients with uh, post-myocardial infarction. It, it, most studies show that it, it hovers around 45%. And this has been repeated multiple times. So this group has come up with a randomized trial. It's not shown in this slide. A randomized trial to First, you, you measure, did someone take the pill out of the bottle or not? So electronically, the pill boxes are set up to detect when a pill has been taken out, and it goes to something on the wall, and it goes into a database. But the individual part is, you know, if you don't take your pill at 12 o'clock noon, and a text immediately goes to your daughter or your son, says, you know, your mother didn't take their pill. And, and the mother knows that. And if, if, that's, if that's the linkage that's important in that family, then that's the approach that, that you use, and you zero in on that for that particular person. Uh, another arm of the study is to use a lottery. And you know, there's small amounts of financial incentives. It's not so much that you're paying, medicine, paying patients to take their medicine so much as to experiment with the process. So every Friday, there's a lottery. And if you're not 100% adherent with your medicines, you're ineligible for the lottery. And you get a message that says, you, know, you would have won this week, except, right? And so there's a subgroup who, who respond to that. 
So they've got all of these different arms of the studies. What do you think the adherence rates are? And these, these are random people who come in from around the United States. It's not like a select group of faculty at Penn. Uh, they're up in the, in the low 90s now. After two years, by putting people in the right arm of, of behavioral modification. This particular uh, slide here, uh, published in the New England Journal a year or two ago, is a, around smoking cessation. You know, a really difficult problem because the, it's an addictive phenomenon. Uh, but they're trying different kinds of, of rewards, whether they're individualized or team-based awards. Sometimes the awards go to both the, the physician and the patient. So they're trying to experiment with what works to get patients to change uh, their behavior. So we've now launched, and I think this will happen at most medical centers, a, a center for personalized diagnostics and, and precision medicine. So in this particular case, it's a genomic approach for the evaluation of either liquid or solid tumors. So we have a panel of deep sequencing for roughly you know, 75 actionable uh, targets in either le leukemias or solid tumors. And you know, here's some of the early data that's coming back. So first, about three quarters of the specimens have a disease-specific mutation. So it's a high hit rate. The challenge, actually, is to get enough of the specimen you know, as, as part of the ongoing clinical care. About 10% of these identify mutations that alter the course of history. So that's not bad, you know, uh, to have a 10% a change of, of, of clinical management. So we're studying this to see, you know, how it plays out in, in clinical practice. One of the early lessons, if, if you look in melanoma, where the BRAF mutation is an actionable target, by doing deep sequencing, you see that in the related pathways, there are actually a lot of mutations. So you can't you should, ideally, you wouldn't just pick out the BRAF, you know, valine to uh, aspartic acid, uh, glutamic acid mutation, because it, it could be uh, the V to K mutation. So we're still learning how best to do this. And we've expanded it now uh, to do pilot studies of precision medicine in different domains at, at Penn. And one of the areas of, of focus is we realize that the payers don't really want us to be doing this, you know, because if we discover things that are actionable, it's going to cost money. And so we're trying to study, in association with the protocols, how we integrate this in uh, to the pathways of clinical care, how we avoid unnecessary treatments, what, is, what are the implications in terms of, of cost effectiveness. If we can do things that you know, provide you know, better clinical outcomes that uh, don't lead to complicated treatments, uh, you know, going forward. That would provide, you know, value. So this is, this group is beginning to come together to bring lots of skill sets beyond just the, the genomics and the diagnostics. The other thing that, you know, I'm very keen, and I think you saw it in the video, is to keep uh, supporting the basic science that's linked ultimately to translational research and, and clinical medicine. So we put institutes together that have you know, great basic researchers, but teamed up with the doctors, so that the doctors are saying, you know, here's the problem I'm dealing with, here's the opportunity, and the basic immunologists, through either the Institute for Immunology or the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies, are assembling, you know, by the dozens and making very good progress. So just as an example, this group over here. We've had to build out uh, GMP, good manufacturing practices, suites where cells can be cultured and then delivered you know, back to patients. But there are opportunities where that could expand beyond leukemia to transplant medicine, diabetes, uh, potentially autoimmune disorders of various types. So I, I think it requires an investment in the, in the science that links the, the basic work with the clinical the other dimension to this is to go beyond our individual institutions. So one of the phenomena that I see is a much more collaborative environment across the country, if not the world. So when Joe Biden came to launch the moonshot, uh, he had a couple of messages for us. 
you know, his, his son uh, died of glioblastoma, so he's very committed to this topic. He said, first of all, you guys aren't going fast enough. And second, you don't collaborate enough with each other. He said, I don't want to hear, you know, what's happening at Sloan Kettering and it's the best place, you know, going or MD Anderson. I want to hear that what's happening at, at Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson is being exchanged to move the field as quickly as possible. So Stand Up to Cancer is a philanthropic group that tries to put dream teams of scientists together around particular disorders like pancreatic cancer. Uh, Sean Parker, younger people in the room know who Sean Parker is because you used Napster. I know you did. I know, you, I know that's where you downloaded your music for free you know, before there was iTunes and, and all of these. So you know, he did Napster, then he launched Facebook. He's interested in science, and he, he's got some uh, allergies and, and immune uh, problems himself, uh, but he realized, like Joe Biden, that there was an opportunity to bring institutions together. So we've, we've now joined a consortium that includes UCSF, Penn, Stanford, UCLA, MD Anderson, uh, Sloan Kettering, where the, the teams are, are pooling their science. They're pooling their intellectual property to try to uh, move it forward. So I think this is a trend that we're going to see. Uh, there are a couple of other examples, and these are hard things to do. It's, it's hard enough to collaborate within your own institution. Uh, it's even more difficult when you start crossing the boundaries. So you know, future opportunities, uh, I think particularly in, in cancer with targeted immunotherapies, we haven't really talked about the microbiome. Uh, but I think this is another good example that will go beyond C. difficile. You know, I, you think about inflammatory bowel disease and metabolic problems. We know very little at this point about the impact of the microbiome on our physiology, its interface with the immune system. We know very little about the things that we do that alter the microbiome, whether it's diet, certainly antibiotics for sure. How does the microbiome metabolize the drugs that we take? Does that vary among individuals? It almost certainly does. So that's a really interesting area. Uh, advanced technologies. We were talking last night about how the field of electrophysiology has really transitioned its approach from pharmacotherapy to using devices and ablative procedures to manage arrhythmias of various types. Uh, why don't we have a closed loop glucose sensing system insulin delivery yet? I mean, it's, it's kind of, you would think we would have been able to do this by now. Um, why can't we pick up seizure disorders before they happen and have some kind of an intervention to disrupt it? You know, that will eventually happen for patients with severe epilepsy. Why can't we detect premature labor at its earliest stages and then intervene? I think devices will be an important part of how those uh, kinds of things occur, and, I, and I've talked about uh, behavioral health. So I appreciate uh, being invited to come to beautiful Madison, Wisconsin, and interact with you, and I'm happy to have uh, time for comments or questions. Thank you very much, Larry. I'll ask you to call on the, the audience and uh, please summarize or repeat the question for the recording. Yes, sir. How are we going to pay for it? If, if we target something extremely narrowly and we need a separate drug or separate intervention for two or three people, how can we afford it? So the, the question is, how are we going to pay for it? You know, I think this is, a, this is a question for medicine broadly, and precision medicine even more so. If, if you think about what's occurred over the last few decades, you bring on a technology like a CT scan or an MRI, and you know, those, the older people in the room, you know, watch this evolve from where you know, a city might have one of these, and patients would be transported from one hospital to the next to use it. I mean, now you know, they sit in the emergency departments and are just part of the protocol of, of evaluating patients you know, very quickly. But it's been quite costly to bring that kind of technology on board. 
and we build it into the cost of the healthcare system, which is growing you know, far too quickly. We, we can't afford this rate of growth. So one phenomenon that happens is that over time, uh, the cost of these new technologies drop. The cost of the drugs drop. Um, but I, I, I don't have a, a, you know, a pithy uh, answer except to say that those of us in the healthcare system have to bring the, the rate of increase uh, down to closer to the inflation rate because it's not sustainable. And I, I think the utilization of resources that's unnecessary is one direction to go. I think in precision medicine, there are opportunities to actually target things in a more cost-effective way if we're careful about how we utilize it. Trying to be more efficient in, in what we do. But I think you know, we've, all, we've all seen the pressures that we're under, particularly as, as companies are struggling uh, to maintain the, the cost of their insurance plans. So it, it's a very important point. Yes? The question is, um, as, we, as we gain more information, particularly with genetic testing, how do we deal with the information that patients might not want to hear? Uh, I mean, this, is a, this is a long-standing issue in genetic counseling. And I, just to make it sort of granular, I mean, imagine that the example that I talked about with, uh, with BRCA testing, BRCA testing. So, Someone in a family is at risk. Uh, they want to be tested. They are tested. They get their result. Uh, but it might be that their sister or their brother uh, has a different view about wanting to know that information. Uh, but now there's knowledge that there's a BRCA positive you know, person in the family. And it's, it's a very difficult process uh, to go through as you work not only with the individual but with the other people in the family who are affected by having that, that information known. And so you know, the genetic counseling community has struggled with this for a long time and I think has you know, reasonable approaches to it so that before the testing is actually carried out, uh, there's a lot of discussion with, with patients and individuals and potentially other family members before the test results are, are even brought forward so that people have thought through the implications before you bring the knowledge forward. But ultimately, you know, my, my own view is that most of this information will be empowering to make informed decisions. Now, there are going to be certain conditions, you know, like ALS or something like this, where you don't have a clear treatment, and maybe you would rather not know that you're affected or not, because it's going to be a heavy and dark, uh, you know, gloomy weight around you uh, as you try to lead your life. But for, for most other conditions, you know, I think this information allows you to act in informed ways and improve your health and have a better outcome. But no, no easy answers to that one. So the, the question, I think many of you could hear it, has to do with uh, trying to modify the approach to clinical trials to speed up the process. And will the randomized prospective 
uh, clinical trial gold standard be the only way that we gain the information to, to act on, on new knowledge. And, uh, again, this was an opinion. I mean, I, I, would, I would love to see novel and broader approaches that not only speed the process up, uh, but, but use more realistic populations. So that if you took the VA population here and were able to mine uh, the data about them, that takes into account the real life features that are relevant, the social determinants of health, experiences that they've had throughout their, their lifetime, and not just you know put them into these pure buckets that once you get the, the data back may not apply to someone who is, is slightly different. So I think as our electronic health records become more robust, as we bring natural language processing in to, to mine that information, as we can code it more effectively, uh, it, it will allow us to speed up some of the clinical trial information that, that comes back. Uh, another feature that's on my mind uh, about this is if we keep subdividing each disease, it becomes very difficult for the general internists to get their head around all of these different disorders and the classification and the implications of that classification for treatment. So as the dean of a medical school, I'm thinking a lot about medical education and how we train the next generation who will practice for another 40 or 50 years to navigate through this. And there's not an easy answer to it, but I think you can't memorize all of this stuff anymore. Even the specialists, I think, can't memorize everything in their domain. So we, we have to learn to access the information in a stepwise fashion, in an iterative way. And I think it has real implications for how generalists and specialists interact with one another. So that you can, at the right point, when someone's got cystic fibrosis or a certain kind of limb, leukemia or lymphoma, you say, you know, now's the time that I need to put this patient in the hands of someone who's very close to this subdivided, you know, phenotypes. They can recommend the right treatment. I can remain engaged and the patient can eventually, you know, come back to me for the management of what's usually multiple different conditions. Yes, sir. Yes, there's a very good uh, report by this same group. It was uh, came out this year in JAMA uh, that looks at, and I, I'm not sure I'll remember all the specifics, but it looks at incentives that go back to patients alone, to the doctors alone, or to the patient and the doctors as a team. And the winning approach was to incentivize the the team the patient and doctor to both uh, receive an incentive when a positive outcome occurs. And so I, I think it's, it's early, uh, but that intuitively that makes sense. That because you're going to, it, it's self-reinforcing. If, if I'm your patient and I'm getting an incentive uh, and come back to, to see you, uh, you're probably pleased if I've followed that or not. Uh, but if you're also receiving the incentive, you say, look, we're, we're in this together, and let's, let's work together to make sure you're sticking with your medicine or stopping smoking, whatever the issue is. Now, intuitively, again, you would think most people would do this anyway, but we, we know that's not the case, so we need something new. Yes? It's a, it's a very good uh, point and set of issues. And I think the scientific and medical
community, when it starts to bump up against these advances, often needs to, to pause and, and have a discussion. You know, we see this now with, with genetic editing as another example, where you know, people knew at some point there would be an advance that would allow us to, to modify the genome. But when the advances that we've seen with CRISPR-Cas9 uh, came out, I mean, suddenly it's like, okay, you know, this can really happen, and it can happen quickly and, and broadly. And so the scientific community came together uh, and has had a discussion, and the recommendation that's come out of that is, you know, we, we should pause uh, before modifying uh, the, the genome with this technology. Usually what happens is that, you know, during this pausing process, there's a, there are a set of iterative steps that take place that allow us to grapple with, with some of the ethical issues in parallel and decide the right balance, the right place to be. And so with genetic editing, you know, I think what we're likely to see is the application of that to somatic tissues first so that you know, if someone's got, say, a, a metabolic disease of the liver that could be corrected or you know, sickle cell anemia is a very good example where you can take the patient's blood cells out and modify them to correct the disorder in principle. This seems likely to be technically uh, feasible. Put them back, but you've not modified that patient's germline genome. It would be a place where we're, we're likely to see that take place uh, for a while. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good point because you know, as scientists and physicians, we're not, we're not in isolation. We're part of a broader society. Again, uh, you know, President Obama has put together uh, a council that's focused on medical ethics. And they meet around some of these problems. And they include ethicists. You know, Steve Hauser, the chair of neurology at, uh, at UCSF, is on that group. The, President of the University of Pennsylvania, Amy Gutman, chairs that group. She's not a scientist. She's a political scientist. So I, I think it's important that we do this in parallel. And certainly Francis Collins has been sensitive to this as a geneticist himself. He's made very sure that the LC group at NIH has been very active as the genome was sequenced, for example. What are the implications of which you know, I, I also sort of struggle with is we have all these guidelines and clinical pathways which we've been asked to follow. So how often should you screen for diabetes and how often should you check blood pressure and you know, what should the range be? I mean, I think those things make sense. But if I'm your patient, you know, I'm, I'm okay with you also thinking about me as an individual and being a little bit creative and the approach that you might take to my management. You know, I think that's what we're, we're all trained to do is, is to balance on the one hand sort of common sense guidelines, but on the other to occasionally uh, you know, jump in and do something different. So we've seen as a field the recommendations around mammography and PSA screening, you know, swing back and forth. Data comes in on one side, and then it comes in on the other. And you know, now we're being told that it, from an epidemiological point of view, it doesn't make sense to be testing uh, everyone for uh, PSA levels because it, it might lead to you know unnecessary procedures and the harm might. But does that mean that we never check the PSA? You know, of course not. I mean, there are going to be a circumstance under which you feel that someone's at, at high risk, and the test should be done. Uh, so it's. It's, it's one of the reasons that the training in medicine is so extensive. <laughs> so you've got a combination of what you learn in medical school and the clinical guidelines, but we're also asking you uh, to make individual decisions and deal with ambiguity. 
We're going to have to close. I want to thank Lindsay Voss for identifying uh, Dr. Jameson as her dream speaker. I think the whole series this year has been wonderful, so my thanks to the chief residents and especially to Dr. Jameson for uh, just being a, a, a wonderful guest, and uh, we so much enjoyed dinner last night with you and hope you enjoy your day and your first visit to Madison, and thank you so much for really a thought-provoking Grand Rounds.